very much, everybody, for staying, actually. I know you guys probably want to get out of here, enjoy the weather, and have a nice beer. That's what I'm doing, actually, after this talk. So, um, Well, thank you for coming. My talk today is going to be uh, introducing a little bit of the capabilities of the Helk, which is a hunting elk. It's a project that I've been working since January, actually. It was the first time that... You know, that I made it uh, public. And, and this one is going to be focusing on one capability of the HELC, which is graph analytics for effective threat hunting. And since we were talking about graphs, I figured that would be probably like a you know, clever way to present myself, I guess. But um, so I'm a security analyst, part of the adversary uh, team, uh, SpectreOps. And I also develop a few projects in GitHub. If you have some time, I would love to get your feedback. And one of them is the Helk, the 300 playbook, the OSIM, which is an open source security metadata. Uh, that one I'm still working on, making sure that I can come up with a um, standard schema for SIM. So that way it's easier to share even rules and things like that and help also others that are building their own SIMs uh, to understand the type of data that they're ingesting. So today we're going to be talking about a little bit uh, of like what effective threat hunting is, and we're going to go all the way from the um, you know, history of graphing all the way to the capabilities that actually Spark is providing to the help via graph frames. And of course, I'll show you a little bit of a future research of the tool itself. But first, I always like to talk about what actually effective threat hunting means. And I feel that anybody can just put anything on that specific blank space, and it just sounds badass, right? Just anybody can just say it. I actually use it for some of my blog posts. But um, I started actually talking a little bit more into what effective really means. And, and this connects directly with why is it that I started developing the Helk itself. But the conversation that I have with my brother, actually, those that probably didn't know, but that's my brother. And it, um, he started talking to me in terms such as efficiency and, and efficacy, and they're not the same, even though some people use it um, as if they were the same with effectiveness. It's, the big difference is that with efficiency, you pretty much focus on the way how you're going to utilize your resources. How are you going to make the best out of your resources? And efficacy is pretty much what everybody wants to do, right? You want to uh, find evil, right? That's the objective. But at the end, effectiveness is pretty much when you still get to your objective, but you do it in a way that it's very efficient. And in sometimes, I would say, in, in the real world, it becomes the, the strategy that is the most economic for your organization and for your team as well. So when you talk about these terms now into detection or any type of, you know, let's say, um, in this case, hunting programs, is when you start thinking, how are you going to be efficient? And I think the MITRE team did a you know, great job today when they were talking about how you can start actually communicating um, you know, with the blue team, red team, and vice versa, when you start doing this purple engagement, it's trying to find a common model that you can follow, such as MITRE attack. So that's pretty much being efficient. Right? And at the same time, it's when you start focusing more into the type of technology that you're going to be using, the people that you're going to be working with, and you, the right skill, do they need training? And at the end, at the end is the efficacy of this whole concept of effectiveness. And here is when you have to be careful, because when you do any type of hunting engagement, um, you don't just expect to find evil. Some people just put that as a metric, and unfortunately, that, um, of course, messes your metrics when you don't find anything and, and, and you just believe that you're not being efficient at all. So that's going to take us now to our next uh, part, which now with these concepts, now you kind of have an idea probably how the industry is uh, actually going from a threat hunting perspective. And everybody's just coming up with these nice methodologies, strategies, awesome programs, um, all the way from pre-hunt activities, where you start identifying data sources, the plan, develop the hypotheses. You start hunting with some nice, um, you know, data analytics and stuff like that, your lessons learned. But I believe that everybody is just focusing so much into what is it that we need to do, but they don't focus exactly what the problem probably is. And everybody talks about the needle in the haystack, but I don't think that people are understanding that their haystack is actually getting bigger. And, and, and that's the big problem that I see a lot in this industry where everybody just wants to do um, the cool stuff, right? But then um, reality is that our data is just getting bigger and bigger that you have to start coming up with different uh, ways to approach this. How efficient you're going to be at approaching this specific problem. So then it comes down into 
why then we start focusing even into graph analytics. And we're going to get to it in a minute. But I think that that's because it, it has got to the point where there is a lot of different uh, tools out there, things that you can build on your own, things you can buy. But they don't give you that flexibility where you can start actually uh, understanding your data in such a way that it becomes really intuitive to find these patterns and things like that. Um, so this concept of like log it all, and I want to have every single piece of data, unfortunately, it brings a lot of different uh, problems also to your detection uh, uh, piece. So the way how I see it is that don't just try to find the needle in the haystack. Try to find the relationships and the structural patterns between all these needles in the haystack. And at the same time, identify the most interesting needles in the haystack. And I think that that's pretty much what, in my opinion, uh, the industry is moving uh, towards to. And that's, of course, because of the amount of data that, they, that you have and the technology that you need to do, uh, use in order to approach this uh, problem. And that's when it starts the conversation of graph analytics, because that's um, a, a specific capability that would allow you to find these patterns and start identifying the most important and interesting uh, needles in the haystack in your environment. So what is a graph? And something simple, how many in here have um, done a work with graph analytics or graphing, graph theory? Anybody? Raise your hand. Oh man, all right, that's, that's, that's good, that's beyond what I was expecting. Uh, so a graph is just a basic representation of your data. When you start um, you know, having nodes and you know, also relationships in between those nodes, so formally a vertex, and then you have an edge. So in this case right here, I follow my brother, my brother follows the Hulk, and Hulk follows myself. Um, and, and here you can uh, start seeing that a graph has also, uh, you know, could be directed. It could be actually a, uh, uh, what's it called, direction both ways and things like that. That's just a basic uh, representation of your data. Some basic terminology. I actually attended a uh, talk about graphing uh, last week. And it was really hard to follow a lot of different concepts. And that's just because I was not aware of a few terms. And that's what this slide is and the second one as well. But this one just starts talking about a couple of things such as, for example, a path, a walk. And, and, and that's something that is going to be really useful when we start defining all these different algorithms that you can use that red teamers are using and they're also blue teamers are, are using. So, just uh, keep an eye on those terms. Uh, this one's too. For example, when you start talking about the adjacent, um, for example, um, vertex, pretty much that's when you have a node, you have an edge, you have another node. So node A is adjacent to node B. So it's just basic stuff. Degrees the number of edges of, 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 on a specific vertex, for example. And the edges are the connections or the the lines coming out of a vertex or a, uh, for example, edge coming in. So you have an in degree and an out degree and things like that. And neighbors, of course, um, you know, vertex that are related to each other. For example, you can have a, a node and you have these two edges and you have your neighbors in there. So basic concepts that are going to be applied to what we're going to be talking in here. But first, let's talk about a little bit of the history of graph theory. And all this started apparently um, in uh, so 1736 with, with Leonard, um, I think you say Euler, um, in Königsberg. So what happened here is that the problem was that you have this beautiful city and you have seven bridges um, in this city. And the problem was how can you actually go through every, um, I would say, piece of land across these bridges only once? Like is that actually even possible? Leonard looked at it, and then he started thinking about these seven bridges. And then what he did is he just started uh, considering each piece of land as if it was a node, a vertex, and then each bridge as if it was a edge, for example. So from here, he started thinking about the way how this can be connected. And this was the basis of just graphing. So what he did is uh, he invented the Eulerian graph walk, 
So we talked about walk a little bit, how you can start finding paths. And what he started thinking is that when you start looking into this graph, uh, it's impossible to actually go through every single node, uh, I'm sorry, through every single edge and, and node once when the um, star and the end, um, I'm sorry, when the um, star at the end, you have the other nodes in the middle. When those two nodes are not odd numbers, the number of edges is not, um, it's not an even number. Uh, you cannot actually go through every single node once. So what he did is he only uh, took, for example, the one in the middle, and you can see that from a star to end, the number of edges is an odd number. You have three in the start, and then you have three at the end. But then on the other ones in the middle, actually they are, um, a, a, they are an even number. You have four on the left, and you have two on the right. So that's just basic concept. It started um, the conversation about how you can start approaching a specific problem with graph and edges and things like that. We started talking about specific type of graphs, like in, um, the indirected graphs and, and directed graphs. And these are just basic concepts you can see. Um, and this will be useful uh, later when we talk about a couple algorithms. Connected graphs basically um, are just graphs that are connected to each other. And they don't necessarily will have a direction. And the disconnected graphs in here, for example, you still have connected graphs. But you can see that you're actually clustering uh, your graph a little bit. Um, even though it's called disconnected, you still do have two uh, graphs that are connected. And then you have, of course, weighted graphs. And these are, uh, for example, think about a GPS when it, it tries to find the um, place of where to go. And then it just calculates the distance. That could be part of the weight of an edge, for example. And a bipartite graph uh, basically is when you want to start uh, dividing your, uh, your nodes. And you start creating this, uh, for example, a bipartite graph that if you have one node and you have um, in one side and you have the other nodes that belong to a specific category, you can start thinking about a graph, um, a star, for example. And that's going to start. Um, pretty much putting us to the conversation into how can I use a graph to start finding some type of reconnaissance and things like that. Uh, for example, there is a new event. Well, last year, there was actually a, a, um, a specific event ID that came out where you know, which actually can help you to start enumerating the behavior of uh, the tool Bloodhound. And that one creates this. Very nice uh, star graphs when you start looking at it from a graph uh, perspective. A walk and a path in a cycle. An open walk is basically um, a sequence of uh, nodes connected by their edges. And that just becomes a path. But when the, op uh, when the walk is a closed walk, that just becomes a circuit. And, and, and then at the end, that's also referred as a cycle. Now, you might be asking to this point, like, how is this going to help me right now? But believe me, like, understand these basic concepts into like, what is the definition of a path, of a cycle, and things like that will make things much easier for us. And at the end, of course, a cycle could be also de uh, determined by a, uh, I would say, number of nodes. For example, you can have a triangle and things like that. In a tree graph in here now, it's basically a graph that it's, it's a little limited. And when I say limited, it's because you have a root node, and then you start going down the path. And within here, actually, it's very interesting because when you think about a, a tree, you start going down your nodes. But you don't necessarily go back to the same node and try to do all these loops and things like that. So when you start thinking about a tree, it's, it's basically to start updating nodes. It's probably to start exploring your paths and things like that. Very useful because it's going to start taking us now to the analytics parts of graphing. But when somebody talks about graph analytics now, after looking into the different types of graphs, People keep thinking about graph analytics as just a graph query. And that's pretty much what I've seen a lot, for example, that people just think about into, I'm just going to connect my node A, my B, and my C, and I'll find my pattern. That's my analytic. But analytic goes beyond that. 
Actually, a graph query is just the first level of an analytic. You have graph algorithms that would actually allow you to uh, find some reasoning on your graph. And in graph analytic itself, it's basically what it's going to take now these results from, you know, from running your algorithms and it start giving you some type of st uh, statistics and things like that, which would allow you to now get closer to what you want to do. If you want to detect something, if you want to find a specific path and things like that. So graph algorithms, now that we understand exactly what type of graphs we have and things like that, pathfinding, centrality, and community detection. Pathfinding pretty much is, well, which you might be familiar a little bit with right now, which is when you started to use something like Bloodhound and you find the shortest path from a local account to a domain admin, for example, or to wherever you want to go. Centrality basically uh, determines the importance of a specific vertex in the whole graph. And community detection is my, uh, the one that I like the most because it allows me to find these specific islands in my graph, specific clusters that I could start actually investigating a little bit more. So when you start uh, talking about pathfinding, now that we understand trees, now that we understand uh, paths, depth first search is one of the first algorithms that what it does, as you can see here in the um, image, it just starts from the top of the tree and then it starts going deep into each node. And what it does, it, it just uses this stacking process, which it starts in the top, goes, let's say, to two, to three, and to four. And if it doesn't find the specific node that it's trying to get, it's just going to go back on the top of, uh, it, uh, it's going to go back and then try to go to the other nodes and then it start touching everything. So it goes deep into a um, specific node. So the way how it goes is one, two, three, four. If I don't find anything, I just go back my stack, and then I go five, six, seven, and then eight, and then nine, and then 10. Now, why is this uh, important to understand? First is because if you see this methodology right here, if I'm looking for the node number 10 that is all the way to the right, I will have to go through every single node first, and then I'll get to 10. So that takes us to the other one, which is a little bit more efficient, which is the breadth uh, first search. And this one, what it does, it just goes level by level. So it starts going from the root node to the second level, it's gonna touch the neighbors, right? We talk about neighbors. So you go one, two, three, four, go to the second level, five, six, seven, eight, and then go to the uh, third level, um, which I believe was six and, no, I think it was nine and, uh, nine and 10, there you go. Um, this is very important because first is it's more efficient, but you start actually touching the a whole graph at the same time, and it, and this tends to, uh, tends to be more efficient. So when you start thinking about breadth first search, we talked about trees as you can see in there, but you can also have these also cycles um, connected to each other, and it just follows the same um, strategy. When you have a node A to a node H and you start going one level and you say, um, let me talk to my neighbors, B and C, the, um, then I talk to D, F, and E, and you go so on, and then you start finding the specific node that you want. This is the basics of shortest path, because in here, you start now understanding, now that I went through my whole graph with the uh, breadth for a search, I can now say, in order for me to go from H to A, all I have to do is go H, F, and then C, and then A. And then in here, you can also start applying weights. And this is how you know, GPS work. So as you can see, like, it's very important to start understanding where everything comes from in order to get to this specific um, um, you know, algorithm, because this is the basics also of you know, Bloodhound. And even though Bloodhound doesn't use um, weights at this point, because all it does is just pretty much finds the uh, you know, session in a different computer, and it's, it just uh, finds the rights that you have on a different computer, and it just um, allows you to, to understand like, what is the path that you need to take, but it doesn't tell you, take this path because the weight is this uh, number, or you know, take this other path. It just pretty much applies the, 
basic concept of the breadth for search, but that's technically you can do it in the shortest path. So, uh, second, uh, as I was saying before, Bloodhound pretty much uses that basic methodology, but when we start talking about now from a defensive perspective, you can start finding this, you know, hidden um, paths in your network. Um, I was talking to, uh, uh, to a company before where they were explaining to me how they, uh, they only had, um, let's say, you know, 30 or 40 different domain admins, and when they started understanding exactly these concepts into going through every single um, node in their environment, they, you know, found out, you know, they had more than 50, of course. So, Bloodhound is, uh, in my opinion, one of the, you know, best, uh, best tools out there, which would allow you to start understanding your, your paths from a defensive and also from an offensive perspective. And you can check these uh, links. For example, there is a blog post for the blue side, and there is a video also. Um, I think uh, that one is from DEF CON. Now, as you can see, like, when I talk to somebody else about graph analytics and then blue teaming and red teaming, they talk to me about Bloodhound, right? But there is more I mean, graph analytics that, in my opinion, starts now going more into the blue side. And when we talk about centrality, um, there are two algorithms that I like the most, which is the page rank and in degree and out degree. And we talked about degree at the beginning of the talk. But page rank pretty much was uh, invented or by the co-founder of Google, and, and, and this one was basically saying that if you have links from other sites that have a high page rank, then you get a high page rank as well. It's like a recursive type of algorithm. And this one would start um, showing which nodes in your environment are the most important based on the connections that uh, you know, the node has. If we talk about in degree and out degree, the basic definition of degree was the number of edges that you, know, that you have. In degree are edges coming to you or to the node, and out degree are edges leaving the node. Very important because this will define, for example, from the in degree side, if I have a node in my environment that is just getting constant connections all at the same time, it might be, for example, a node being used for exfiltration. Or if you have an out degree, you might have you know, some type of reconnaissance, or you might have, for example, Bloodhound just going crazy and trying uh, to find the specific paths and you know, shortest paths in your environment and things like that. Community detection, uh, strongly connected, and then we have also level propagation and triangle counting. And we come back to the concepts of having a disconnected graph and a connected graph. So connected components basically will find these islands in your environment, and, and, and necessarily it doesn't take direction when it starts um, creating these clusters. Strongly connected, on the other hand, uh, takes direction. And here is where you can start uh, finding these islands that are also connected to each other. Because it's strongly connected, takes in consideration direction, but at the same time, it, it, um, it takes into consideration the fact that these uh, nodes are also connected to each other, and there is a path going um, through every single node. As you can see on the ones in the square, I can go, um, I can go around every single node, and the other ones, even though they are still connected to the graph, there is not a path that can go over those other vertices as well. So very important, uh, what's it called, algorithms to, to understand. And then level propagation, it's more like, uh, it's more like applying a label or, or, or a tag uh, you know, to, to a specific node. And then at the end, it starts to then define uh, communities in your environment just by understanding the connections that it has and things like that. So after going through all this stuff, you might be thinking, all right, so now let's just graph everything, right? Because it just seems that that's the way to go. Going back to the efficiency, let's be honest, right? Um, organizations are not just ready putting all their logs into a graph database or just applying graph to everything. You have to understand where you can apply it and where you cannot apply it. So that's what it's so important to start understanding what is it that you're trying to accomplish with graphing. Um, and of course, the, the technology piece is very important. 
Um, I haven't seen, for example, a uh, Neo4j database uh, being used as a pr uh, primary sim, for example. I haven't seen that. Probably it's happening, but you don't see that that often. There are other components that are, um, will not allow you just to have that as your main database and things like that. So when I started thinking about what is it that I can do with open source and what is it that I can start uh, building in order to start understanding these concepts, but at the same time, to start using a infrastructure that organizations are already using, for example. Um, I've seen a few organizations already that I've been working with um, that use Elasticsearch as their you know, primary um, you know, database and it's, the concept was more, I have to build something that will um, align with what is it that is happening out there and what is it that people are using out there. So the architecture in here is pretty simple. So you start basically with your endpoints on the left, and then it sends all the data to Kafka, and Kafka is just basically a subscribe, publish type of uh, technology where it just gathers all the data, and then you have other technologies subscribing to Kafka topics, and then it pulls the data. In this case, we have Logstat, that it's a real-time pipeline um, you know, technology you know, with capabilities that allows you to uh, parse your data, transform it in any way you want, sends the data to Elasticsearch, and then the, the part that allows me to interact with Elasticsearch is actually ES Hadoop, which is an elastic, small, standalone library that allows you to execute Hadoop jobs on any type of uh, uh, database that has this you know, library, for example, in this case, Elasticsearch. But at the same time, it doesn't need Hadoop itself, like the infrastructure, um, to execute these jobs. You can actually have something like Spark um, um, on the top, and that communicates directly with Elasticsearch. Then you have Kibana, which is just the interface to start querying and doing basic, um, you know, basic analytics with Elasticsearch. And then we have also graph frames, which I'm going to be talking about today. And then we have Jupyter Lab, which would allow me to have also an interface where I can start uh, documenting my, my procedures and things that I can do with my data. That's just a slide for reference that uh, you guys are going to have later. So it just talks about all the features that I talked today. And Graph Frames um, basically is just an Apache Spark package. It's not part of a Spark yet. Um, and it just uses the Spark SQL APIs and also data frames. Data frames are a tabular format of your data. So think about as an Excel sheet. You have your columns and then you have your rows. So that's the basic concept of a data frame. And then uh, this one. Um, um, Graph Frames also uses a cipher-like query to start also running uh, graph queries into your data. And the way how it works is you have Elasticsearch with ES Hadoop being like the bridge between Spark and Elasticsearch, and then Graph Frames sits on the top of Spark SQL using the, uh, Spark SQL APIs and data frames, and then it just provides these graphing uh, you know, capabilities. So how does graph, com uh, graph frames compare to a graph database? Well, Spark does not store data in a long term, so it's not a database. So Sp uh, Spark graph frames is not going to store data either. And Spark is capable to build all this graph you know, computation via you know, graph frames. That's pretty much the difference. Graph databases are totally different than just you know, graph frames. Um, for example, Neo4j, you can still do your analytics, but um, they depend on each other. With the graph frames, you can, start, uh, you can sit on the top of Elasticsearch and other technologies. So how do you build a graph with graph frames? And this one takes the basic concepts also that we talked about today. And it just takes two data frames, one which is going to be your vertices, your nodes. So in this case, one to five. And then you have properties, the name, the age of this, of this specific uh, node. And then you have the source and destination uh, data frame. You put those two, and then basically that will give you a graph where you will be able to start running queries on the top of them. And as you can see, for those that have used Neo4j, it has a cipher-like type of query. 
you can see here from um, A to B, and then, and then uh, these names of A, A, B, and B are not necessarily uh, values. It's pretty much where you're going to be naming your columns once you get your results. And then graph frames also gives you graph algorithms, and as you can see, it touches basically all the algorithms that we talked about today. So one thing that I wanted to show you real quick, I only have, I think, 10 minutes, but um, there was an exercise actually last week um, where SpectreOps was providing training, and they give me a small data set of, of what happened in this training, and, and, and this one um, was just Sysmon EID3, which is network connections. So I would like to explore my data, but first we've got to build our graph. And the reason why I'm doing this is because we went all the way from telling you what a graph is, but then all the way to start understanding how you can start using the help um, to start playing a little bit in your environment and start manipulating graphs as well. So I think it's better if I show you with a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, let's see, let me just go back in here. There you go. There you go. Oh, so I'm just going to do this. Oh. Is that good? All right. Let me just move this right here. So this Jupyter Notebook uh, is going to be available also um, in once I publish the slides. I'll, I can just make it available. So in here, as you can see, Jupyter Lab was the component that connected to Spark and then it sparked to Elasticsearch. It just has that connection. So the first thing is that you can um, start, for example, running a Spark variables and it will tell you exactly if there is already a connection. Um, at the same time, you can start importing your graph frame libraries. And then you don't have to understand this whole code, but at least it's going to be there so for you can follow it as well. And with here, you can start now connecting, creating your Spark variable that will connect with your Elasticsearch uh, database. And then from there, we can start, um, let me just see if I can move this a little bit, move this. From there, you can start now pointing to the specific, um, for example, index that you want to have. And it's just there over there. And then from there, uh, you can see that automatically all that is saved into a variable. Uh, it's called DF index, for example. It's a data frame. And then from there, I can start understanding the schema of my data. Very useful because then with this, I can start understanding what is it that I can start playing with, what queries I can run, and what relationships um, I can find in my data as well. And these are basically all the uh, data field names that I have in my Elasticsearch database. And you can also read from a CSV file, and that's just the basic uh, you know, commands in there. Um, and this is what I started playing a little bit with the Red Team data, data set that I got. And as you can see in here, it's pretty easy just to start using the also SQL-like uh, you know, type of commands. And something interesting in here, I don't know if you can see it already, but uh, that was weird automatically. I mean, you one, two, three, destination port, uh, SVC host, and a local service, uh, even though we didn't do any graphing yet, but uh, that, that already was weird to me. Um, so the way how you build your graphs, you can you got to start building your vertices, as I said before. And I show you the table of two data frames, the vertices and the edges. The vertices is going to um, be, once again, having your ID. And then on the right is just any property that you want that specific object to have. In this case, I took the IP address of, uh, of the source IP address of Sysmon event ID 3. And then I have my username, my process, and the destination port, for example. Um, and then at the end, I can just start building my edges, which is just uh, taking the data frame that I have and then just saying, give me the source and the destination IP. Um, as easy as that, I can just now type my uh, graph in here. And then I can start playing with that graph. I have my number of vertices in here and my numbers of uh, edges. and 
oh, this one ended. Because uh, I was running this, actually, when Justin was talking, just making sure that I had a better query. But with this one, it was easy now that I have my graph in a variable G. So for those that cannot see it yet, uh, here it is. Uh, it's right here. So when I created my graph frame, um, graph, then I can start just playing with a variable G. And then I say, G, find me anything. Um, a, a source to a destination where, at the, where there, um, then I can have the same destination to be my source, and then from my source to then go back to A, for example, A to B, and then to B to A. Just a basic, um, I would say, querying here, but just a little interesting to know, for example, show me these connections that are happening in my environment from a computer A to a computer B, and then from a computer B to a computer A that do have the same username, just basic stuff. Um, and then from there, I can start now showing uh, a little bit of, of the results in here. Let me see if I can just, that, that, looks, that looks way better. Um, and then I could say, for example, I could see some uh, processes in here connecting from, you know, 10, uh, 11, 10, 25 to 10, 11, 10, 101, and then, and then that same uh, host and goes back and talks to my 10, 11, 10, 25. So with, with this, I can start now just adding any patterns that I want, and, and, and that's just as easy as that. Then from here, I can start, I can actually run this right now. Uh, so I can start understanding, let's see, let me just go back one more time so you can see it. Uh, what I do now is I take my graph and I start getting a little bit of data um, information about the graph. And let me run these two queries in here. Once again, this is going to be published, so you can follow it as well. And the data set as well is going to be um, uh, published. And that's just going to take some time. So let me just go back. You can also create subgraphs. So if your graph is really big, you can start just reducing that with this query. And then you can start applying, for example, the graph algorithms like page rank. Uh, that's the, the commands that you need. Then you have, for example, the in and out degrees. This one's going to take a little longer. But um, you can start following this, and you will be able to start getting all this information from your graph. Now, since I have only five minutes now, let me just go back in here and mm -hmm. all that is also in the, in the slides, so, so you can follow it as well. And da, 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 connect components. So the future of the Hulk now, after showing you just the basics of how you can start playing with your data, it doesn't matter if you don't have a graph database at this point. As you can see, I was able to pull all the data from Elasticsearch and also from a CSV file. So it depends how you want to start ingesting your data. Of course, I would recommend to do it directly from Elasticsearch because that's the you know, real world type of um, you know, approach. But the future for uh, Helk is that now um, there is this library you know, that was created uh, in, I would say, in collaboration with Neo4j and also Apache Spark, where it's going to now um, open source already the Cypher query language. Uh, let me see if I can go a little closer. No, I can go closer for you guys. Um, but that one over there, for example, is going to allow um, that help to use a, a different notebook as well called Zeppelin. And Zeppelin would allow me to start using this Neo4j open source Cypher uh, query project that is called Cypher for Apache Spark. And then it's going to allow me just to get my data, the same concept of, of having Elasticsearch using Cypher for Apache Spark, and then have also the visualization all together. So it will be a way easier to do. Um, they are, they're releasing that hopefully at the end of May. So I was kind of like bummed that I couldn't actually use it for this uh, presentation, but it's almost there. And something that I'm doing in the, uh, um, just in the middle, meanwhile I wait for, um, you know, for Apache, for Cypher for Apache Spark, is actually key, uh, Vega visualizations for Kibana. And that one allows me to start using just a basic, let's say, a you know d3.js type of um, script, and then I can just push JSON into my Kibana, and then I can start showing all my uh, dots and things like that. And 
before I, I think I still have one more minute, I was gonna show you something here, uh, not that one. Uh, before, well, that one, just in case if you're wondering, this is uh, MITRE's data sources to techniques. So this D3.js can be imported into Kibana. So basically here, I'm just trying to say which data source is the one that um, I will carry the most first because it's connected to the more, uh, most techniques. So with this one, I was able to find my stars in here, and I was able to start finding these also uh, you know, connected components that allow me to understand which ones were the most interesting to me and uh, things like that. But before, I want to show you this. I think it's called RTO label. Yep. Uh, yep, index label. This is what the class looked like last week, um, which was very interesting because uh, <laughs> every uh, red team in the class has its own uh, environment. And you can see that they were all over the place uh, in each environment. So I was able to see all these connected components. And um, it made sense at the beginning. I just looked at it, and I was like, why there is not connections between uh, each little island? And it's because they do have their own um, their own um, you know environments and things like that. So that was pretty interesting. But I want to emphasize the fact that, for example, looking at it that way, I, 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 I uh, wasn't able to get a lot of information. But going through the algorithms and then running the queries, there is where I was able to start finding some interesting uh, stuff about the data. So graphing is not just about showing you dots and edges. It's about understanding the methodology that you can use via graph analytics, for example, where you can start finding the relationships in in your environment and finding also the most important uh, or most interesting relationships in your environment as well. All right, um, and that's it. That's the my GitHub if you can get to the project and also I have a couple of uh, resources that you can see as well. Thank you very much. I don't know if anybody has any questions. I'm sorry, I was taking my microphone off. Oh, he has a question over there? Yep. Yeah. I'll go back to the basics. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning that walking the tree uh, depth first isn't as efficient as going breadth first. Why is that? Because you end up walking through the same set of nodes. When you talk about depth, uh, so the question was, why is more efficient to use the breadth first. breadth first and not the depth? depth? Yeah. All right, that's because, for example, if you're doing a uh, shortest path, right? Let's say you're using the same concept as, you know, Bloodhound, right? The depth first, uh, first search. Let's say I want to go from a one to a seven, for example, in there. Um, it's going to start going through all the, uh, 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 it's going to pick one neighbor, and then once it finds that neighbor, then it's going to keep going down that neighbor instead of asking their other neighbors as, as if it was a you know, level out. So that, yep. that rule applies only if you, in specific applications, not generally. Correct, exactly. Okay. So for the application of the you know, shortest path, I, I like to understand what's going on per level every time I try to find something, because then I will be able to understand what is the shortest path to go back to my root node. So number one, for example. If I go deep, I'm going to go so probably, you know, depending on the environment, I can go so far deep that it's going to take a long time to find the shortest path. So it depends on the, uh, the application of the algorithms, I would say. Yep. Anybody else has a question? Yes. Anybody over there? All right. Um, I have a question regarding actually like what is the added benefit of, uh, of your project? Because as I understand, you basically put the whole stack all together, and basically that's what you currently have to offer, right? Or is there anything else apart from that, like advanced analytics? Oh, yeah, 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 no, definitely, yeah. Thank you for that, that question, actually. Uh, 
Today, uh, um, today, I just wanted to talk about the, the graphing capability. Now, the graphing pieces is still also being developed by um, you know, people that work with Databricks, for example, Apache Spark. Um, so let me just go back to the, I'm going to show you the, there you go. So yeah, there are different applications. Like I just show you the little piece over there on the right. Um, one application that I'm working on as well is to start um, enabling some real-time analytics. So every time anybody wants to, for example, run a query to find some type of anomaly and things like that, you wait until the data goes all the way to your database, and then you apply your analytics, and then you just run your query across your whole database. What I'm trying to do now is using Kafka and using also Apache Spark, so two implementations. Um, so Kafka has a new project called KSQL, and KSQL allows me to query my data in transit. So when my logs are going through Kafka, I can have KSQL queries uh, get, uh, start doing joins in real time, and it starts also finding all these specific things that I wanted to tell me about in real time. And then from there, for example, another thing that I can do is have Spark has different libraries. It doesn't just use GraphRames. It, it, it does have one that is also called Spark Streaming. And Spark Streaming allows me also to start running some other um, you know, algorithms in real time um, with the help of Kafka as well. So that's also one of the other things that I'm working on. Uh, the other thing that I'm going to be working on is um, start using now some other um, way to start using different notebooks for uh, companies. For example, if, if someone wants to use Zeppelin, someone wants to use Jupyter Lab, and then they start building also um, procedures for security analysts to understand how they can go about their data. Because if I have my data standardized, I can start creating playbooks because then I know what to expect from a data perspective. And then I can start uh, sharing those notebooks with my security analysts and then probably help them to, um, you know, in, uh, helping through their investigations, for example. That if they have a couple questions, but they don't have much of experience, then I can just share what I know or what everybody else has know uh, about a specific incident and then have everything documented. So there are different implementations in here, things that, you know, things that one can do. I'm also pushing this to Kubernetes um, as the platform to build it instead of using Docker containers. Um, um, I would say strategy, but then using Kubernetes to manage the whole cluster. So things like that also would allow me to scale it. And you know, but there's a lot that, that we can do. I mean, like, that was just like a little piece of the whole project. So, yep. anybody has uh, any other question about the tool, graphing? No, I'm gonna be um, you know around and tomorrow as well. So if you have any questions, let me know. This is a you know, work in progress is still. That's what it is. It's still alpha. So if you have any feedback or anything that you would like to contribute, um, you know, I'm open to any conversations and feedback. All right, thank you very much. OK, awesome. Thanks, Rodrigo.